Well, welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. This is Rachel Marshall. We've got my co-host, Bruce Weiner, as well as the famed and honorable Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another conversation. I believe this is our fifth conversation with you, Rabbi, on this show. Oh, who's counting? Thank you, Rachel and, and Bruce. It's uh, it's lovely to be with you. I mean, first of all, I, I love what your company does. I love the, the whole uh, infinite banking concept and the way you help people and guide them in their financial quest. Um, and what's more, the uh, the conversations we've had, not one of them has been boring or arduous. And uh, and I, I don't know if you know what I mean by that. It sort of depends how many interviews one does. I do quite mm-hmm. a few. And there are some of them that drag. Bruce, you're laughing because you've probably had some experience on that. But, oh, yes. but it's... Um, you know, it's just very refreshing to be with you guys because I've been looking forward to it, and and I know the time's going to go very quickly, uh, and sometimes <laughs> it just um, it doesn't. I I know things are not looking good when the host uh, reads a chapter title from one of my books and says, "Talk to us about that." <laughs> <laughs> There's so much to unpack. How could we possibly yeah. cover that in a podcast episode, right? <clears throat> Yeah, for sure. Well, let me go ahead and start. If you are listening or tuning in today, it's possible that you have seen Rabbi Lapin's work before in some of the books that he's written or possibly on his own shows. It's possible that you are coming to the Money Advantage and you have not yet experienced Rabbi Daniel Lapin. So I want to give you a taste of what his background is, and then we'll ask you as well, just for anyone who might potentially not be familiar, although I think most people listening to the show probably are. So Rabbi Daniel Lappin, he's an author, speaker, TV host, and he's immigrated to the U.S. from South Africa after studying mathematics, physics, and economics in Israel and in the U.K. Now, some of his seven books are America's Real War, Business Secrets from the Bible, and Thou Shall Prosper, The Ten Commandments for Making Money. And these have all been translated into Chinese and Korean. I will speak as well. My husband and I, Lucas, have both begun our awareness of you, Rabbi, since reading Thou Shall Prosper. And I think we originally purchased that book in the ballpark of about 10 or so years ago. So a fantastic book and um, a really great starting point to learn a little bit more about what you and Uh, what you do. Thank you. So Rabbi is also a frequent speaker for trade groups, political and civic organizations, financial conferences, and companies in the U.S., Europe, and in Asia. Um, He also has Newsweek has included him on its first list of America's 50 most influential rabbis. And so we're very proud to know him. We're honored to be able to have him join us on the show. Um, You've got a podcast called We Happy Warriors. You've done a lot of other work as well. And I do not know the name of your television show. Is it? um, Can you share us? It's Ancient ancient Jewish Wisdom. Oh, of course, it's right in front of me. I was not sure. (laughs) I should have shared that. Okay. So your television show is Ancient Jewish Wisdom. Um, You also have the We Happy Warriors podcast. And he's also an enthusiastic boater who has sailed his family across the Pacific in their own boat. And might I say that that was family, including wife and many of their seven children. So just a a powerful, amazing, dynamic speaker with tremendous wisdom. And that is what we're going to really unpack today. We're going to be talking about your newest program called Financial Prosperity. And just a brief glimpse into this idea is that there are people who throughout history have prospered and people who have not. And it doesn't necessarily confine itself to a geographical region. It's not a particular age. It's not a particular, um, it's not a particular industry that someone goes into. There are principles of understanding how money really works. Um, I'll let you say how the world really works the way that you do on your show. But Rabbi Lappin has really unpacked and dug deep and sought to understand this, this challenge, this, this, this question, why do some people truly prosper and some do not? And, and you have a tremendous amount of wisdom and leaning on ancient Jewish 
scripture and just the way that the people, uh, the Jewish people in general have prospered. So you're going to be talking today about the abundance mindset and really about reading versus watching, which I'm very curious to unpack. And then why giving is so tremendously powerful and why it needs to come before getting and how it tre tremendously just changes your entire perspective. So Rabbi, again, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And uh, these are topics I love talking about. And, and the only uh, issue I take with your kind and overly generous introduction uh, is that I don't know if, if I possess any wisdom or not. Uh, I like to have my children think I do. But um, what I teach is not the result of my ruminations and contemplations. Um, it's just the uh, ancient Jewish wisdom that I was taught. And ancient Jewish wisdom um, is incredibly powerful and, uh, and, and very, very effective as well. Uh, so... Um, as much as I'd like to think of myself as this genius who sat down and figured out all these truths about money and human beings, uh, honesty compels me to uh, concede that um, what I am is I'm an exceptionally good transmitter. Mm. Uh, I like to think of myself as a clean window. You can see through me into the scintillating and incandescent brilliance of ancient Jewish wisdom. And uh, like any window, if you can actually see the window, it means it needs a cleaning. <laughs> Very good. So, Rabbi, before we get into the abundance mindset, I, you know, we can always talk about is, uh, certain issues and topics, but I often try to look at it deeper. It's like, why did those particular issues and topics come to being? Or, or are they even worth thinking about? And one of the things I, I'd like to talk about it is why, it is why is it so hard for people to feel good about prospering in our society mm -hmm. or in our on earth in, in, in general? And, you know, I can pull upon my, <clears throat> my life and growing up in Catholic schools. And, you know, I was always taught by the, <clears throat> the nuns that, you know, you, you got to give. And if you have too much, you got to give. And, and people that a lot of times they, they didn't really say it, but they said, you know, if, they, if you have too much, that's really not right. And they kind of ingrained that in, into you. And um, so I think that that carries on with a lot of people in our society. And so I think that's a good place to start is why it's ingrained in the, into you. And then one of the people that I've been studying his philosophies a lot uh, is Jordan Peterson uh, lately. And you know, Jordan actually brings up this idea that um, people think that when they have, when other people have a lot, they, they got it and they're a bad person and they're corrupt and so on and so forth. And he brings in a, a basically an economic principle is, yeah, you, that can work in the short term, but really it's not going to work on the long term. And that is very true. That is basic economic principles. When you do something true to your nature and you provide a service for a person, you get rewarded for it. So the basic principle is actually wrong too. So that's where I'd like to come into this abundant mindset and prosperity, uh, looking at it from the very beginning yeah. in, that, in that particular instance. No, it's a, it's a great place to begin, Bruce. And, and of course, uh, I agree with you entirely. Uh, it, I've, I've often mentioned this uh, to, to friends and my wife and I talk about it, how it breaks our heart when we often arrive. I speak at about 20 or 30 churches a year before COVID anyway, and it's picking up again now. And um, I can tell literally before I walk into the church, we only have to drive into the parking lot and we can tell if this is a church that has, born in, has, has um, bought into the equation that reads poverty equals virtue. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really important because we walk in and we'll see, a, you know, we'll see a light bulb out, we'll see some um, grass poking through cracks in the parking lot, and we'll see the, the wall needs a, a bit of paint. And then after that, we usually meet the pastor and his wife, and the wife's face just shows lines of stress. And we know what that's from, you know, because somehow the pastor's the last guy to get paid in the, in in the hierarchy. So, uh, uh, and and one of our greatest joys is to do a seminar for that church and then come back six months or a year later, and and see the change. Now it doesn't happen every time, mm -hmm. um, because for some people 
a one-day seminar or a half-a-day seminar is not enough to rid them of that incredibly destructive mindset. And the, uh, obviously the mindset is, is very important. I mean, at an Olympic level, what separates athletes is not bodily perfection. They are all at the peak of physical perfection. What distinguishes them is simply uh, psychological and spiritual, the will to win and the ability to endure pain. That, that's what makes a, an Olympic winner today. It's not, it's not that their body is better tuned or that they have a better coach or that they have better technology. Everybody at that level, everybody has the same. Uh, it's only internal. And, um, and so it becomes incredibly important in life's great races, such as economic, uh, it becomes incredibly important um, to actually have the right mindset. Now, we need to spend a moment uh, talking about the very important thing you brought up, which was, you know, why do, they, why do so many people have it? And it's, it's not an accident that the deterioration in outlook on money, and I'm talking now about the United States of America, but I know that you've got audience all around the world, and, and I, I really do know that because I get letters from people all around the world and um, and they tell me that they heard of me or they saw me first on your show. As a matter of fact, just this last week, um, not this week, last week, and I may have I may have mentioned this to you, Rachel, but I did a program for a, a group of engineering students just outside Manchester in the UK, and their professor who wanted me to talk to them because they are uh, finishing their studies and they're about to embark on their careers. And he wanted them to hear that what they were about to start doing now was not a moral sellout, but they were actually starting to do something much more valuable mm -hmm. than sitting in college. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, he heard of me through through your show. So uh, wherever you are, the the point is that in the United States, People's negative attitudes towards finances and prosperity uh, happen to correspond with America's deterioration from basically a, uh, a Judeo-Christian Bible-based worldview to a secular worldview. Mm. And it's very easy to see. I mean, this, the, this is not debatable. What I'm telling you is something that everyone with their own eyes sees, and that is that um, a secular worldview tends to go hand in hand with socialism. Now, that's not to say that there are no secular wealthy people. Of course they are. But philosophically and uh, in an overall, but in other words, um, you know, in uh, any one person can choose to do whatever he wants to do. But the reason that polling works is that when you examine 3,000 people at a lot, you can pretty much predict what 3,000 people are going to do. Doesn't mean that all of them, there might be 11 of them who do different things, but in terms, so it is that when a large group of people, millions strong in a society or a community, uh, begin to take a, uh, a God-free view of uh, reality and of the world, and, and I'm going to show in a moment, I just want to make clear that this discussion, this is not a synagogue or a church discussion. We're having a business and finance discussion. Yes. And I really, I, I really want people to understand that um, these ideas that lurk in the, in the hearts of mankind uh, shape to an enormous extent what happens to the group. It may not necessarily shape exactly what happens to any and every single individual, but it does to the group. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the consequences are, are very, very real. And so uh, what happens is if, if you are secular in outlook, that means that you are materialistic. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's nothing in the world that you can't touch or drive or wear or eat or, or, or measure in a lab. And, and that means that everything in your world is subject to the laws of physics. Now, one of the uh, unarguable laws of physics, and uh, it's, it stands quite reliably, is that uh, any one object can only be in one place at one time. And so um, if we're sitting opposite one another at a table and my uh, mug 
of coffee suddenly vanishes and when I next look it's sitting there in front of Bruce it's a reasonable assumption that he took it and um, and then if I if I come back a day later and I see he's got 10 pretty yellow mugs in front of him I think to myself gosh he makes a habit of this it's not me just me he took a mug from he's been doing it from a lot of people now replace mug with money and the secular mindset looks at somebody with a few dollars in the bank and says, oh, he has to have taken it from other people. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they don't think in terms of making, they think in terms of taking. Right. Because in the material world, in the world of physics, there's a law we have called the um, uh, preservation of energy and also the preservation of matter. So what that means is when you burn a candle, uh, you know, whatever the candle weighs, show, you know, six ounces of candle, you burn it and at the end there's just a tiny little pile of wax and a dead wick and you say, well, I've, I've destroyed matter. But you haven't. The reality is that if we would gather all the energy in the form of light and heat that came off the candle and we would gather all the gases like carbon monoxide that came off the candle and weigh everything, it'll come out to weigh exactly what the candle weighed in the first place. There is no way to destroy energy. Uh, and therefore, you, the, the presumption is that, um, that energy cannot be brought, nothing can be brought into being other than being from something else. So if you've got money, then you have to have taken it from somewhere else. The idea that you can bring it into being without any prior I mean, that that baffles the laws of physics physics doesn't deal with that there is mm -hmm. no way it's just not part of the world of physics so if i um if i sit in a room and compose a beautiful piece of music which i'm sorry to have to say is probably not likely to happen anytime soon and i take this piece of music and i uh send it out of this room on uh uh, in, a, in an mp3 file and it goes to a music publisher and they uh, print lots of copies of it and they license it to, uh, to um, uh, musicians and then uh, lots of money comes in to the publisher and the publisher calls me up and says do you want the uh, do you want us to deposit a check in your bank I say no please help me out here what I'd like you to do is go along and uh, and buy uh, you know, five hundred dollars worth of groceries and food, and uh, another five hundred dollars worth of beautiful baked goods, and another five hundred dollars worth of seafood, and have it delivered to my room. And now, all of a sudden, through no physical act of creation at all, all I've done is brought into being a, a tune which I pulled out of my spirit. Mm -hmm. I have now exchanged that and I have created a huge table filled with enough food to satisfy a family for six weeks. How did I bring all that food into existence? Through the act of creation. Mm -hmm. Now, physics doesn't discuss. If I ask a physicist, so explain what I've just done, he says, you know, you're not talking my language. This is, uh, this is not my field. And, 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 this is what making money is. And that's why a materialist, somebody who only sees a secular worldview, cannot comfortably relate to the idea that you don't take money, you make money. That that's, is, that's what it is. So when you rule that out, the acquisition, of or the acquisition of money is obviously an act of taking. And furthermore, the possession of money is evidence of malfeasance prior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So obviously, people who think of themselves as good and decent people look down on anyone who makes money. But it didn't used to be like that. Children in America were brought up on a series of books called the Horatio Alger books. Now, I'm going to guess Rachel doesn't know about them and Bruce does. Yes, I've I heard do. you mention them before. I have not read them. Right. Now... Uh, that's obviously because you're a woman and Bruce is a man and women don't know about... No, it's not. It's that, <laughs> it's that uh, 
evidently you are far younger than Bruce. And uh, in your generation, nobody knew, nobody spoke about Horatia Alger books. But in Bruce's generation and in mine, it was very common for mothers to raise their children with the Horatia Alger books and stories um, because they were, they show how a person with good values and good qualities imbued by loving parents is capable of making a lot of money, which is all a beautiful, wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. So that's why, that's why it's bad in, in the eyes of an increasingly materialistic society. And it's so fascinating that you bring that back to even a, a spiritual versus secular way yes. of seeing things. And if we are stuck in that current way of thinking secularly, the interesting thing is it can be the people who are most following the Bible and who are most in the Christian culture and community and space who feel the worst about money. And so it seems like a dichotomy or a contradiction the way you started by saying, well, it's, it's a secular problem, but if we are in a secular society and we live in a secular way of being, and we apply our secularism to our concept of the Bible, then we get a very confusing mixed message about yes, money. That's, well, that's, reading that's that exactly the point, right. And it's not just Christian you know, churches that I speak about where I go and there they are suffused in, in the poverty virtue equation. Unfortunately, it's in, it's in some synagogues as well, in some Jewish communities. And where, where that comes from is the, uh, the idea, unfortunately, that God and the Bible and faith is all about unworldly things Mm -hmm. and so i'm a rabbi don't talk to me about uh working out in a gym i am not interested in bodies i'm only interested in souls and you know don't talk to me about money my mind is on much higher things than mere money and what happens unfortunately in in some religious circles churches and synagogues jewish and christian um is that the the uh the the concern and the focus and the attention is paid to the words in the bible but it doesn't extend to shaping cultural values. Mm. Really, God wants us to shape our cultural values from him, not mm. from the people around us. The whole idea of Abraham was the Abraham, the Hebrew, the word Hebrew means on the other side, willing to stand alone and apart from everybody else. I've never known why the symbol of Judaism wasn't the salmon, the fish that swims upstream. I've never understood that. I, you know, if I ever do over and, and set things up, I'm going to make the salmon the official uh, fish of Judaism. <laughs> because, yeah, you've got to be able to swim upstream. So, yeah, sadly, in, in, in many devout and pious uh, Jewish communities, the actual values about money are not taken from the Bible. They're taken from popular culture. It's, so it's very, very it's, sad and, uh, and, and, yeah. and problematic, and I, I write about this and I speak about it. But, uh, b- but when people do see the light and when they break through, the beautiful thing is that their finances quickly follow suit. And, uh, and there is an improvement because we are shaped by these things. And uh, I suppose that really brings us to the whole idea of, um, of abundance. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, for that, I, I have to uh, briefly allude to something that uh, I actually spoke about in a recent one of my podcasts. That it's very exciting because, um, and I'm sure this happens to you with this show as well. I'm, you, I'm sure you get fascinating mail from lots and lots of people who, who watched it. And, and I, I cherish that because so much of that contains absolute uh, gold. And so recently I spoke about um, the, uh, the, the idea of a spiritual schematic, that each of us inside of us have spiritual schematics. Sometimes they come from our childhood, sometimes they come from our early youth or adulthood, um, and sometimes they come later. It doesn't matter where your spiritual schematic comes from. Uh, but to just give you an idea, the, the important thing to know about a spiritual schematic is, number one, it shapes how you think and act. 
Mm-hmm. And number two, <clears throat> camouflages itself and makes you figure out a completely different explanation for why you're acting the way you're acting. That's what you got to know. So to actually know yourself, which is a biblical instruction, it's really hard because there are many times where I think I am acting as the result of brilliant, rational thought process. And in reality, I'm just singing the tune straight off my spiritual schematic. Let me give you an example. Um, this this happens to me very often, when, uh, especially when I, when I do call-in radio. And, um, and I speak about, so um, are there any people who do not want to ever get married and certainly do not ever want to bring children into the world? And yes, there are lots of people like that and they're willing to talk about it. Great. So let's talk. Tell me, why don't you want to get married? And she says, because marriage is nothing but institutionalized drudgery and I am not able to fulfill my aspirations and use my talents. And he says, well, I wouldn't jump out of an airplane with a parachute that has a 50% chance of opening. I'm not going to get into a marriage that's got a 50% chance of survival. And when it fails, she's going to take all my money and the kids. Okay, how about having children? And uh, she said, yeah, I'm, I don't want to have children. I'm, I'm gonna, and by the way, a large number of young women actually undergoing sterilization now. And your future, I'm sure in the future, uh, people will look back on the doctors who did this and say, why weren't they put on trial? It's incredible. How can a doctor sterilize an 18-year-old woman? But they do. Mm. Why? Because they don't want to bring children into this rotten world. Or alternatively, uh, something I hear is also, uh, do you realize the carbon footprint that child's going to leave his whole life and the damage this child's going to do to the environment? I would want to bring a child in. Okay. Now, here's the, the good part. As a radio host, I can be very cunning. And I try and put my caller's mind at ease and I try to relax them and I become affable and agreeable, which isn't easy for me. And... Um, and then when their guard is down, I always say, talk to me about your childhood. Like, how were you brought up? And i got to tell you guys, almost without exception, almost without exception, every one of them starts with a horror tale. Broken uh, parents, broken marriage, divorce, uh, sometimes foster families, um, all kinds of horrible, horrible childhoods. Now, they don't for one moment make the association that that's the real reason they don't want to get married. That spiritual schematic was imprinted on their souls. Mm -hmm. But none of us ever say, oh, I'm just saying that because of my spiritual schematic. No, I'm saying that because I don't think we should bring children into this rough world and I don't think we should spoil the environment and say blah, 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 blah. And, uh, And that's the secret of spiritual schematic. And so uh, many, many, many people today have a spiritual schematic that um, having money is a sign that you're a horrible person. And so here's the best part of that, because when you believe that and that's imprinted on your spiritual schematic, you're able to say, well, you know why I'm poor? You know why I'm bad with money? Because I'm a good, decent human being. I am not greedy. And I'm not going to do anything for the almighty dollar. I mean, that's what people tell me all the time. And I'm a good person. Because they have a spiritual schematic indelibly imprinted on their soul, which says making money is an act of greed. It's taking money away from other people. And above all, you know, and, and, and here's the best part. May I, may I add one more thing to this? Oh, please do. Please. Here's the best part of it. And that is that a secular mindset is also a mindset of shortage. And so, you know, from the time today's millennials uh, were at school, they were doing recycling because there's a shortage of landfill and there's a shortage of paper and there's a shortage of plastic and um and and they bug their father to get a gas efficient car instead of a v12 bmw because um there's a shortage of petroleum if you're secular you live in a world of shortage 
Now, why is that? Well, if you're secular, you're materialistic. If you're materialistic, nothing comes into being. It's all it's just all there and gets shuffled around. And so if I live in a world of shortage, what sort of horrible human being am I to want more? Mm-hmm. That means I'm getting more than my fair share. Must mm-hmm. be other people who are having less because I have more. It is an unbelievably dim-witted um, uh, philosopher, psychologist, and ethicist called Peter Singer who insists that I am not allowed to buy myself a new suit because for the cost of a new suit, I can feed a hundred children in Africa for a week. That's his position. Now, I don't dispute that there are hungry people in Africa, and I don't dispute that a lot can be done for them. But that has nothing to do with how I choose to, to spend my money. Mm -hmm. There's so, so much packed in and I, I hate to even um, speak because I know you just have so much that you're unveiling here. I've never been told in a nicer way that I talk too much. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I can uh, be very diplomatic. So what I would like to go back to though is We started with this concept of financial prosperity. Nobody's going to come across that or look for that that title or that term or or seek it out if they're not interested in making more money. And yet what you're saying is there's sometimes this guilt and these negative feelings and this connotation that, well, that's something bad that I don't want to admit that I'm interested in. And somehow if I'm wanting to prosper that I have some moral problem in the fabric of my being. And what you're saying is that we need a new spiritual schematic to understand that dollars are created, money is created the same way that God created the heavens and the earth, the same way that we were created beings, we were meant to create. And as we then have this expansive, abundant, creating viewpoint and vantage on life, that's completely different than the limiting, shrinking, money in short supply, everything in short supply, and I have to fight for my own survival, which then leads over into the idea that, I mean, people have so many challenging perspectives about money. I mean, it can even go as far as saying, well, I don't want to leave an inheritance to my children. I need to give all my money away. And that could be potentially doing a lot of good, but what should you do, should you give everything away versus living, uh, to, versus enjoying your own wealth? And so can you speak for a moment to the idea of how can we do the most good in the world? Maybe it's not by thinking of giving everything away. Yeah, uh, you, you're exactly right. And as, um, you know, because that always fascinates me, your question, um, before I start a program, and you know, let's say I'm doing a, a, an afternoon program for a, for a group, and um, it's going to be on, and I'm very clear about this. It's a it's on financial abundance. You know, no euphemisms. I'm not I'm not talking about anything other than increasing your revenue, changing your financial statement for next year or this year. Uh, and I often say to people, so please. Put up your hands and tell me, why do you want to be prosperous? Why? And almost to a person, Rachel, um, their responses are, because then I can do so much good with my money. I can give it to my church. I can tithe. I can do this. I can do that. So none of them see any virtue in the making of the money in the first place, because they've partially bought into that idea that It's evil, but they are going to vindicate themselves by giving away money. Uh, This is exactly like the pirates of the Caribbean in the 17th century, in the 18th century. Um, It's exactly how those guys used to work. And I I don't know if I've ever told you this, but you know there were Jewish pirates out there? I think you mentioned that. The first uh, time you were on the show. Oh, I did mention that. That's great. Because like I say, uh, I find it enormously reassuring to know that if this rabbi thing doesn't work out, there is an alternative (laughs) career path. Uh, 
I mean, you know, spend, a spend the time, <laughs> spend your time boating and plundering. Well, he's been pretty pretty time good. On the boat, right? You, you got, you the, got boat. the boat part down. <laughs> yeah, right. And and after all, people believe that business is plunder anyway. Mm. But what is the uh, what do the old pirates of the old days do when, after a long and successful career, uh, the pirate wants to settle down and be have a respectable role in in society? What he does is he uses a lot of his ill-gotten gains to build a church or a home for the bishop or, or whatever it is. And, and there are many places like that in Kingston to this day uh, where you can see things that were built by pirates uh, in order to buy their way into respectability. Well, that's exactly what a lot of wealthy philanthropists do today. They know that they're looked down on. They know that they are viewed with reprehensibility. And um, the, uh, the, the, the solution is give money away. So that way we're able to, uh, to sort of show that we may have been evil and horrible people as we took all this money. But now, in any event, we're giving back to society what we stole in our ill-gotten way. So that's, that's a, a, a really important part of it. But the, uh, the subsequent part of your question is that making money... Um, is at its heart uh, one of the most moral and dignified things you can possibly do because the only way you can get it is by pleasing other people i was gonna say can you please transition from this exact thought making money is the most moral thing that you can do because before you make money you have to and you yeah. shared you give before you get yes you've you, you've got to that's right. And so, um, you know, I may sit in my room for three weeks trying to compose that tune and nobody is sending me any meals, but I have to put it out into the world first and then I get back. And, um, and, and, and that really is, is at the, the core of what we're talking about. Um, very often young people, you know, coming to this time of the year, it's coming close to graduation and people are, are, are leaving college. And sometimes they say to me, when I ask, what are your plans for next year? They say, with great pride, um, I want to serve a little bit. So I'm going to go into politics. And my response is, <laughs> go away. Because you going into politics just means that you are going to get a job with pay you couldn't earn in the private sector. And with pension and benefits, you'd never get in the private sector. And your 10 fingers are now going to be digging at my wallet because somebody's got to pay you. I don't want you in politics. Go and create an app or compose a song or uh, design a nice pair of shoes. or Go and make my life better, please. I don't need somebody else in Washington telling me what to do with my life. So, Rabbi, you, uh, you mentioned about how people have, listen all over the world and we have people from uh, Zambia and Scotland listening today uh, they've, they've commented and when we when I do talk to people from all over the world that is kind of a, a theme you know because they they really we're all the same all over the world and what we want our families to be good we want to be able to um, freely express our views uh, which could be in many cases our, our views about religion and then the other thing we want is the governments to stay out of our lives. It, all, it, that is, that's universal. Um, I'd like to go back to one thing that you and I can relate to is, you know, one of the things that has happened is, you know, they keep saying, well, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And the fact of the matter is the rich are getting richer, but the poor are getting richer. And they're getting a lot richer at a very uh, accelerated pace. You and I can look back into... 50s and 60s, and we can remember, you know, uh, central air conditioning was for the elite. And, uh, you know, we, I remember as a young boy, you know, we suffered through Midwest heat and humidity with a little fan that we were watching in our school, our school room, go back and forth, anticipating when it was going to blow on you. I mean, it was the greatest thing in the world when it finally got to you. You know, uh, I can remember actual ice box, not refrigerators. Yes. People, people may not even know the difference, uh, but an ice box, you actually had to put a block of ice into it 
because it, it did not produce its own uh, cooling. Uh, cell phones, uh, you could talk to anybody, <clears throat> any teacher that is helping out youth today. And, you know, we have these government programs that they think are so great as far as um, early breakfasts and free lunches. But the, but the youth that are receiving these are also coming to school with $250 Air Jordans and, and, oh, cell, sure. and cell phones. And, yep. so, and so the fact of the matter is, yes, the rich may be getting richer, but the poor are getting very, very rich compared to just yeah. a f- few decades ago. And the reason for it is, is that there are people out there that are producing more and more services and good that are making society even better. Right. No, that, that's exactly right. And, um, and, and I would add one more thing uh, to, to what you're saying, Bruce, and what Rachel mentioned earlier, and that is um, I really don't want anybody, I don't want anyone in my orbit to try and make the world a better place. Stop doing that, please. Just improve your life, and my life will automatically improve. That's how God set up human society. For you to try and ch- improve the world means you're going to have to use force because otherwise how are you going to get people to conform to your vision of what a better world looks like which may not be what my better world looks like please leave the world alone just look after your own life and everyone around you will be happier very good go back to the what you said about making money in the first place and the context of family or even inheritance but one thing i wanted to comment on that was um I was reading this book about uh, there was a study on very wealthy families from somebody who uh, was a consultant to the family, an attorney who he learned from his father, who also they, they would serve some of the wealthiest families around the world and help them and, and counsel them. And they said that uh, the author was uh, towards the end of his life writing, saying um, that every family he's seen is successful. Um, the, the family has an enterprise. So not only do they have a family business that they maintain, but they are an enterprising, they see the family as an enterprise. Right. And he said that the families that sell that, there's, he has yet to see one that he called a mon- uh, just, just purely a money family that maintained their success pe- mo- for many generations. And so uh, that goes back to Rachel's question about people saying, oh, I should just give it all away and inher- how inheritance fits in with that. And um, people worrying about, but my kids don't need it or I'm going to corrupt them or all these different things that people might say about um, the, fam- the family. So it, it seems like it's tied into the idea of creating money in the first place because the idea of an enterprising family. And I believe um, in Eastern um, um, philosophies, culture, culture. Yeah. The, the family is much more um, seen as an economic unit and as a multi-generational um, line. So, as you know, on my website, I teach the 5F system. Mm -hmm. And the secret of the 5F, what makes it counterintuitive and difficult and challenging, is that you have to develop all five simultaneously and in balance. Anybody who focuses on one to the detriment of the other four is going to find themselves in trouble. Well, the the five are family, finance, faith, fitness, and friendships. So there are definitely people, and again, I'm talking about the United States. I don't know about you, but there's like 11 gyms within a few minutes of my house, you know. Uh, there's, There's more gyms than churches. There's more gyms than grocery stores for heaven's sake um right that's because the and by the way in los angeles when i lived in los angeles the number of gyms was doubled like about 20 of them within walking distance Mm. um because this is a culture that's put physical fitness ahead of everything else now if you uh if you take somebody who puts finance above everything else and all he's done is devoting his life to making money then he asks me, uh, well, you know, I've got to figure out what I'm going to do. Uh, should I leave it to my children or shall I um, give it a charity? I said to him, I think you should probably give it a charity because I'm assuming your children don't share your value system. You haven't given them enough attention over the years. So why would you want to do that? Rather get rid of it now so as it goes to causes you care about. 
But if somebody builds their life based on all five F's, and sure enough, I mean, you know, if your finances are in good shape, and your family is terrific, and you have a fulfilling home and a happy marriage, and you've, you're physically fit, and on top of that, you've got a good connection with your creator, you know, and you've got friends, you don't have a lot to complain about in life, do you? You know, it's, it's pretty good. And so if you've been doing that, of course you should leave your money to your children. Why, why wouldn't you? That's, they are an extension of you legitimately and appropriately. That's what you've created. They, they're not carbon copies of you, but hopefully in values, they share your values. I don't care how my children decorate their homes, and I don't care if one of my uh, sons-in-law likes electric cars. You know, that's all fine. God bless you. But when it comes to the fundamental values, we're all walking in sync with one another. You know, of course I would like them to take over my business and my finances, obviously. Who, who's going to be better with it? This is just a fascinating topic, and I would love to even dig down that path of family further. Um, we might need to leave that till our next episode with you because... Oh, goody. That, love... that means you, you're considering <laughs> another occasion. <Good>. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So there was something else that you brought up that I was fascinated by. Bruce, I did not ask either of you if we we're okay going a few minutes past. Um, I'm, I'm okay if, if we are. Are you both okay if we go a little bit past the top of the hour? Yes. Okay. So you had mentioned as well the financial power of reading over watching, which... Um, that is a first that I've heard that idea. I can speculate what that means, but go ahead and please share however much time you need to unpack this. Go ahead and take that time. What is the no, difference? No, I, won't, I won't take as long as that. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, I'm not going to give you only two minutes. You just um, go ahead and share with us. What is the difference? Well, between that would be a, that would be. Uh, where I'll leave it is is that it'll you know it'll end up being a good launch pad for another occasion when we get together. But uh, uh, again, not to not to um, uh, to tease you mercilessly about your youthfulness, Rachel. But well, my uh, hair speaks otherwise. So. <laughs> oh, I, I thought that was deliberate highlights. Oh, of course, absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, the uh, so again something that. You know, and I, I say Bruce and I, because we probably had a fairly similar kind of upbringing in terms of overall outlook and perspective, I imagine. But I'm guessing that uh, he heard what I heard plenty times from my mother, which was, uh, stop watching television, read a book. And that is not heard today. Mm. Um, nobody in American history reads less than today's millennials. Mm. Um, I've seen several polls, and I don't sort of really rely 100% on polls, but they certainly are showing a trend, and that is that uh, most millennials have not read a book in the last month. Um, they're looking at devices, mm. and to them, they think there's no difference. There's a huge difference. Um, first of all, um, again, I mean, this... Uh, there is so much uh, scientifically based evidence on this, and it's so well established that uh, it doesn't even need much in the way of, of uh, verification or argument. But bottom line is a uh, male testosterone drops in proportion to time spent watching screens. Mm. And so if you've, if you've seen any interesting statistics on how young males today seem less interested in sex than their predecessors... There's a very good reason for that. Uh, the passivity. Okay, here I'm, I'm going to sort of tread a bit carefully and I'm going to try and um, keep in realization that this is a family show and uh, I've, I, I will choose my language accordingly. But um, let, me, let me put it this way, that masculinity and femininity um, uh, at... at, at at times of ultimate uh, fulfillment, in a sense, um, for the male, uh, activity and action is much more a reality, whereas for uh, the woman, it tends to be uh, a slightly more passive outlook. I hope I hope that makes sense. And um, 
And that's one of the reasons that, you know, we speak about, well, there are all kinds of advertisements and all kinds of things, and they speak about male performance, but nobody speaks about female performance because it's different. And so it's, there's no question that the passivity of watching a screen where everything is done for you, there's very little cognitive process mm-hmm. because it's visualized. You, you're not exercising your imagination one little bit. And, and on the financial side, one of the things that's so challenging is that, uh, and I hear this again and again, men say to me, well, you know, why are you single for heaven's sake? You're 36 years old. What's the matter with you? Why are you letting life pass you? Oh, life's not passing me by. You know what a good life I have. Yeah, but tell me, why aren't you married? And well, because I can't find a woman who will love me for myself, for who I am. You're dead right about that. She'd have to be a silly little girl if she did. Absolutely. Because you haven't, as a male, you have not yet accepted the burden of performance. Mm. That you are judged and defined by what you've achieved. That's not true for women. And the proof of it is, and I I mean, I, I understand that times are changing and people are different. I get all that. But bottom line when uh, when people travel and they end up talking to somebody on a plane if you're sitting next to a guy almost the first question men ask each other is what do you do the question most men would like to ask the woman they're sitting next to although today they may be frightened to do so they they're not that interested in what she does they'll say that what they really want to know is is she attached it's a different deal And so what I'm talking about here is that um, watching destroys the imagination. With no imagination, there's no way you're ever going to dream up a business plan. You won't. It's as simple as that. Imagination is an incredibly powerful business tool. I've got to imagine how life could be better. Not only for me, but for my potential customer. And I can't do that if I have no imagination. Screens, movies, anything you watch is a destroyer of imagination. Reading is, does exactly the reverse. And reading exercises the entire cognitive process and what's more, gives you information with a much higher chance of retention. And so um, I, and then finally, what reading does is equips and enhances your most powerful business money-making organ, and that's your mouth, the ability to communicate effectively. And watching dulls and, uh, and, and uh, causes that to stagnate. Reading builds your vocabulary and your communicative ability. And so um, it's, it's odd, but that in a business development program, uh, you know, I would focus and, and spend serious time and effort getting people to commit to cutting out four hours a week of watch time. That's, you would think that's not so terrible. I mean, considering how much time people really do spend watching, knock out four hours and devote it to reading instead. You won't recognize yourself in six months. You literally won't recognize yourself. So in a nutshell, that's the, uh, that is the read, don't watch story, Rachel. That is unless a great jumping point into... Uh, hold on. Unless you're watching the Money Advantage podcast with Rabbi Daniel Lappin, <laughs> this is going to... <laughs> it, goes, it, goes without saying. it goes without saying. Yeah. So, and, then, no, and then you have I'll the I'll tell you something about... funny. Uh, I, I do my podcast on YouTube in an audio form. And I th- always thought to myself, well, that's better because you can exercise while you're listening, you can uh, go for a walk while you're listening, you can even wash the dishes while you're listening, it's fine. And just as an experiment, I put the most recent one up as a video as well. It's just like this, it's me sitting right here, talking my podcast out, 
and it's perform like it vastly outperforms the audio one. So I was going to say watch your, the right things. Your Go discussion ahead. about uh, watching versus reading <laughs> great segue, not now, but into a conversation about why they, why, you know, why do we call it programming? <laughs> <laughs> leave that to the uh listeners. yeah you're right Mom. yeah well wow. well hey so let's go ahead and work towards wrapping up i want to um share we've had lots of people commenting mostly on youtube here so bruce had mentioned earlier we had somebody from scotland, scotland. we had zambia there was others as well so we've got somebody from Florida. new york new city york. where there's the large hasidic community of jews in monsi new york yes um, that's right and, and, and then, didi just came on from angola Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Okay. One from Libreville. I'm not sure um, where that is specifically, but James has commented there. And then Winter Springs, Florida. And um, somebody said, so he's saying I should be looking for a silly little girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so. because, no, yeah, right. I mean, the uh, you, it, it would be a foolish girl who um, throws her life into sync with that of a man um, who is not achieving anything in the world. Yeah, so, so go make your world better and make yourself better and then other people will benefit. I, I didn't mean to say it that way because I'm sure that came off wrong. Go make yourself better, improve your own life, and then you probably will improve the best your thing you can do for everybody else. Uh, Samuel Johnson, the English essayist, put it best. He said, never is a man more innocently employed when, other than when trying to further his own economic interests. Mm. He's not hurting anybody else. It's one of the few times he's only helping me, not hurting me. But ah. if, he's trying to, if he's trying to pass new laws, he may say they're going to help me, but every law has an unintended consequence that's also going to hurt me and bite me. So, yes. uh, so uh, I don't know if you followed this, but uh, there are a couple of uh, senators right now that are trying to pass a law to get rid of Amazon Prime. And, I, and their whole rationale, yeah, their whole rationale, and I don't have time to go into the, the, the economics of this, but I'll try to help people, is that it's a, they think it's virtuous that they're taking care of the small businesses because oh. they think Amazon has an advantage. However, what they do not understand is that Amazon actually fulfills for a, most of their fulfillment is for, from small businesses. Small businesses that do not have to ship. They do not have to have warehouse space. They do not have to do returns. They do not have to do communication. So they can, these small businesses are flourishing through uh, uh, Amazon. But I will the, tell you this. When I'm in charge, <laughs> there's going to be a rule, a law, punishable by death, that nobody can become a politician until he has run a private business. For absolutely. Them. Absolutely. <laughs> that is awesome. Yes. <laughs> Oh my goodness. There's so, so much value here. I, I felt like we were stepping into Atlas Shrugged for a moment as well. Um, Rabbi, I'm not sure if you have heard of that book or have read it, but. No, I, I, I know, I know a lot about Ayn Rand, its author, and I know the book, of course, very well indeed. And, and I think, you know, she was very, she was very clever and, uh, and, and wrote extraordinarily well. Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead are, are terrific, but one should pretty much get over those books by the time you're out of high school. Um, because she stipulates basically a world where there is no spiritual value and there is no um, compassion and goodness either. So it's it's she does, and there's a piece of that as well that values production and and recognizes the the fallacy or the problem with saying just give it all away, just do the good. She doesn't have all five S. No, she doesn't. <laughs> no, 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 not not at all. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're complex people, us human beings. So um, oh, the fact that there's a lot that was bad about her doesn't mean that her books aren't worth reading. They are, but you should pretty much get it out of your system before you hit the 18 year old level. So um, we, I have a great question that is a final great way that we can close. Um, another person watching from New Zealand, by the way, um, Vic Vickerson asks, what kind of business does Mr. Lappin run? So I'm going to change that to Rabbi Lappin. Can you please go ahead and share with us how somebody can find you? What work do you have available? And please make us aware of this new program on financial prosperity that you yeah, sure. have available. 
Um, so uh, in my past, I've been in, in the real estate business. I've also been in the boat building business, not surprisingly. But uh, at the moment, my business is publishing. And you will find uh, my website at rabbidaniellappin.com. rabbidaniellappin.com. That's uh, L-A-P-I-N. Sorry, L-A-P-I-N. Or you can just type in you need a rabbi.com. Uh, that works as well because I humbly submit my candidacy for your consideration. And um, uh, you'll there be able to see the program, Financial Prosperity Collection, and uh, you'll enjoy that. And it should uh, bring you the same benefits that it's brought uh, huge numbers of other people. Wonderful. So please go there. You can find out everything else that he has available, all the books that he has written, the programming, the podcast, the radio show that he has as well. So the radio show is Ancient Jewish Wisdom. The podcast is We Happy Warriors. I can vouch for that. It's just fantastic. I know you have courses. My husband, Lucas, here is going through one of your courses on scrolling through scripture. So yeah. many resources and tools to dig into ancient Jewish wisdom and figure out how to apply those principles to your life. And I think it's a fascinating testament to the depth of scripture to be able to continue to study and learn and understand that it is so much richer and more meaningful than most of us had ever realized. So thank you for being a part of making that available to, to people. Well, thanks for having me again. I really appreciate it. It's, it's wonderful talking to you. And, and I really like that, uh, that, that you have audience all around the world like that. That's, it's beautiful because essentially it is the, the idea of money that is bringing us all together, which yes, is great. Absolutely. Absolutely uh, terrific. I mean, to conclude, a, uh, a Jewish immigrant um, to South Africa, where I was, I, I grew up and spent my childhood. He arrived from an Eastern European country called Lithuania, and um, he uh, tried to get a bank account, and he wanted to open his bank account, and he, but he couldn't speak English, and um, the bank manager stood up and welcomed him in and opened the account for him. The assistant bank manager was watching all this. Afterwards, when this person went out, he said to his boss, what do you let him open an account at our bank for? The man can barely talk English. And the bank manager took out some money and he held it in his hand. He says, yeah, but he talks this. <laughs> and that's really true. Um, whether it's people, people who trade with each other don't fight. And for the most part, nations that trade with one another don't fight either. Mm. Now, those are some deep thoughts that we could ponder for quite some time. So we will close the show today. Thank you all for being with us. We have not gotten to all of the questions on the podcast. I would encourage you to go read Thou Shall Prosper, grab Rabbi's newest program called Financial Prosperity, and we will have him join us again in the future. This has been a pleasure having an ongoing conversation. So thank you so much for joining us today, Rabbi. Thank you for Thank listening. you, Rachel and Lucas and, and Bruce. Much appreciate having you having me back. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. And in closing, please remember, success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd, and build a life and business you love. <laughs>